Bible told us, hold no graven images before the Lord thy God. And it wasn't talking about totem poles or golden calves, like we thought. It was actually talking about anything of time and space that you hold more valuable than God or than your true self will block you from the awareness of love. So, spirit is not a religion, spirit is not a theology, spirit is a state of mind, and love is that same state of mind. And you can't know that presence as long as you value anything else besides that presence. That's why, of all the commandments, you know, the two that Jesus emphasized was love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and might, and love thy neighbor as thyself. As thyself. Not as a separate entity or a separate being. So, when the song said, you literally are your brother, you literally are your sister, that's pointing to all the great traditions that teach that God is love and God is one. Instead of using a spirituality which emphasizes only meditation and kind of seclusion away, like go off to the cave or go off to the forest, it's saying, no, you can actually do this with an open-eyed meditation of being shown that what you think of as somebody other than you is not actually other than you at all. That's why giving and receiving are the same. All that I give is given to myself. There literally is not two. That's what Advaita means and Advaita Vedanta, not two. This is literally a teaching of not two. And the most glorious experience is when you relax into that state, and if, if there is not two, then all must be well. It must be that you can just relax in that state of forgiveness, in that state of remembrance of who you are. So, a key element for the ego is the belief in sacrifice, and what Jesus teaches us through A Course in Miracles is while you believe in sacrifice, then love is unknown. And therefore, he defines sacrifice very simply in the Manual for Teachers as the giving up of what you want. So he's going to work with the idea, because it's so heavily believed in. And the giving up of what you want it is very, very simple. That you have been called by God to the most holy function there could ever be forgiveness. And that is your calling. Your calling really isn't a calling in form. It may seem to take a form for a little while, but it's really a calling into presence, into divine presence and remembrance. And you have been called by God, and Jesus says, would you now sacrifice the call? If, the, if sacrifice is the giving up of what you want, you have linear time, we'll say on one hand, and you have the call to remember God on the other hand. And really that's the only thing you have to come to a reckoning with. Am I going to sacrifice the call to experience spirit, or am I going to sacrifice than your time. Because sacrifice is the giving up of what you want. In other words, you can't value linear time and know the experience of love. That when you start giving yourself over to spirit, time will seem to collapse. You will have moments, glorious, glorious moments of stillness, of losing all awareness of time and all awareness of space. And never the twain will meet. You, you cannot experience and maintain the experience of that love and have a dedication to anything of time. Not to a career or a job, not to a child, not to a partner, 
not to the environment or improving Mother Earth, not to anything that seems to involve, we'll say, improvement even. Because who you were created as is pure spirit. You were created perfect, originally, and then anything else of time is an attempt to add on to that perfection. That's why Buddha said, empty your mind of everything you think you think and think you know. That's why all authentic pathways to God, be still and know that I am God, involves stillness and emptying the mind of everything. And you have to have a sense that you will not be obliterated by this emptying, that you will actually be found. You will find yourself through this emptying. So, what I'm sharing is, it's okay to let go of everything. Of absolutely every concept, of every construct. It's more than okay, it's actually wonderful. And everything, even in the letting go, that you seem to need, will be provided without effort. So you don't have to use linear thought to try to figure out the world, to try to solve the world. You don't really have a band of time and space that you can use between birth and death. That's, that's the currency of the ego, is time. As if you are given a band of time between birth and death to use any way that you want to. That's the human condition, the belief that you have been given time to use any way that you want to. When actually, the Holy Spirit just uses time to teach you that there is no time. There's not like a positive outcome for this linear world. We're not looking for a happy picture in the end where everyone sits around and holds hands and you sing a song together, you know. We're not looking into celebrations in terms of form, we're not looking into rituals, we're looking into the beauty and the glory of, of absolute presence and stillness. So really, to answer the call, you just have to cultivate a sense of, of reverence, of reverence for your creation by God. And you can't put your mind's allegiance toward anything of time and space and experience that reverence. It was 24 years ago when I, I felt this huge, huge calling. And for me, saying yes to that meant saying no to the future. No in the sense of ambitions. What will my life be? What do I want it to become? Letting go of the belief that, that I would want to make something of myself in the future. That one, you might say, mental act of saying, I hand my future over to you. I have no desire for a future. I have no desire to have a better world. I have no desire to fix anything or change anything. Is a, is a desire of unified awareness to be who you are. It's not a desire to, to change or fix the world in any way. It's, it's an act of saying, I would hold no expectations of time and space, so that I may come to know who you are and who I am in you. And that makes all the difference. And it's really, as Jenny and, and Greg were talking about, it's really not necessarily a matter of time. It's really a matter of desire. It only seems to be a process with the belief in time, but it actually is not a process. All 
attempts to make a better self, or even to make a more spiritual self, are part of the wheel of karma, or part of the wheel, which in the end is a defense against the holy instant, a defense against the present moment. And that's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is seeing the false as false, and you can't possibly see the false as false unless you are aligned with the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit's function, to see the false as false. Human beings, people, don't ever see the false as false. You'll never be able to say, I have finally arrived as a human being. Because the human being itself is a construct that was made to defend against love. Ultimately, love is not interpersonal. That was made up by the ego as a substitute for love. And you know the guilt that comes from trying to improve or make perfect these constructs called interpersonal relationships. It's like sending yourself on an impossible mission that could never be accomplished. So, what is this experience of the miracle? Jesus tells us, miracles are involuntary and should not be under conscious control. That is amazing. Miracles are involuntary, meaning that when you give yourself over fully to the miracle, you make no effort to consciously control time and space. There is no effort required in the miracle. Everything, absolutely everything is given. And to the human being that seems absolutely incredible. It seems like it, it actually even takes an effort to move a finger. It seems like there's conscious control over the movement of the finger. But it's not so. It seems like it requires conscious control to live. To rise out of bed each day, to go to work, to earn money, to feed the body, to clothe the body, to take care of one's environment and one's living space. But actually that's the biggest trick of all, is believing that you are consciously and in control of a human life, any human life. That's the biggest trick. And you know, that's where stress enters, thinking you are in control of something, or you have personal responsibility over something, that you can control anything at all, is where stress and difficulty enter. This is the core of, of spirituality, the, the serenity prayer. What you can control, what you cannot control, and the wisdom to know the difference. Jesus tells us you can control the direction of your thinking, you cannot control the world, and the Holy Spirit is the wisdom to know the difference. Well, what is controlling the direction of your thinking except being in total alignment with Spirit? Of giving all your thoughts over to Spirit and say, I would hold nothing apart from you. My mind holds only what I think with God. I cannot think apart from you, God. I cannot live apart from you, God. I exist as an idea in the mind of God, in the mind of Spirit, and I have no life apart from my Creator. No life apart from my source. That's the most happy experience that there could ever be. Knowing yourself as a creation of God, in alignment with God. 
But that also means that you don't have control over the world. Some of you have heard of uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, some of you have heard of the Gospel of Thomas, the Lost Gospel of Thomas. In the Gospel of Thomas, the shortest teaching of Jesus has been found. And that's, be passers-by. It's just two words that actually would summarize the entire teachings of Jesus Christ. Be passers-by. And he actually teaches that in the Course. He actually teaches that in Lesson 128. The world I see holds nothing that I want. The only value that this world holds for you, he says, is that you pass it by and look no further there. When the teachings came through the New Testament and said, be in the world but not of it, do you know that for 2,000 years human beings have been trying to find out what that means? Be in the world but not of it. And yet, what Greg was reading, that passage from the Course, is basically saying, you cannot find yourself in a world that was made to take the place of God. You cannot find yourself in images because God didn't create you as an image. And the Bible says God created you in His likeness and image. There is no image of God. God is eternal. God is pure spirit. It just means God created you as a, in a like quality as God. God created you as spirit. And therefore, when you try to find yourself in the form, you look for yourself where it can never actually be found. So what's the answer? If, if this be in the world but not of it thing is still not fully in complete alignment, then it must be that you could live in such alignment, with such purity, with such grace, with such intuitive fullness, that you no longer reacted or responded to any of the images in the world. You were living in your source living in the presence, seeing that you're dreaming, but not reacting and responding to any of the dream figures. That's what this is about. That's what happiness is about. It's happy for no earthly reason. Only the ego tells you you can be happy because of certain outcomes in the world, certain form outcomes. But all of us have experienced, from planet Earth, that when you achieve a form outcome that you think will bring you happiness, it does not last. And then you're forced to go for more goals, more attempts, and maybe look around left and right and see, how are they doing over there? They seem happy. They got this, they got that, they achieved this, they accomplished that, they possess this, they possess that. There really is no happiness in possessing. There is no happiness in achieving, as the world would say, you've achieved this, you've accumulated this. What happens in the human life when you retire? And you have, maybe you get a gold watch, or maybe you get some kind of memorial for all those years of work. But what have you really experienced if you're not happy, if you're not actually happy? What profiteth a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? So, you can live a life of joy, but in order to be that joy, in order to fully experience that joy, it has to come from within you. It can't come 
from the images of the world. It will never come from a man. It will never come from a woman. It will never come from a child. It will never come from a certain configuration of planet Earth. You know, everyone says, I haven't got my life the way I want it yet, but one day it's going to work out. One day in the future, things are going to work out. But it's almost like being on a, a karmic hamster wheel, going round and round and round and round, and just spinning and spinning and spinning. And the spinning itself is a state of discontent, a sense of searching, a sense of seeking, striving. So is this practical? I would say this state is, is absolutely, positively the most practical experience there could ever be, and is attempting to achieve happiness in form practical, I would say that is the most impractical attempt you will ever make if you search for it where it can never be found. It would be like putting your head through a brick wall, trying and convincing yourself, I'll just keep at it here. And that would be very impractical and it's the same thing to search for answers where answers cannot be found. Now this call is really very, very simple because it's a call to be happy. It's not really a call to give yourself over to some pre-decided form where you just have to give yourself over and you have to just do what's required of you. What exactly is required of you? You know, this is the, the theme in a lot of religions. Do what is required of you. Well, the only thing that is required is to be happy. Because God's will is for perfect happiness. But you can see that the, the honesty must come in from experiencing happiness that is not dependent on the ego or dependent on the world. Because the ego is not who you are, and the world is not who you are. And no experience of linear time will ever yield happiness. It just is perpetual discontent. It is restlessness. It is boredom. It is a sense of incompletion, of I'm not there yet, but it's, it's a sense of constantly just spinning round and round and round and round <coughs> and actually trying to make this discontent acceptable. That's where the struggle comes in, trying to make yourself content with restlessness, with boredom, with time, trying to be content with all the concepts of linear time. To dream the impossible dream, that's it, that's it, that's what the attempt is. So what we have here, this experience right now, is an opportunity to let your curiosity up, let your, I want to know the truth up, to let your excitement up, to let your joy up, to open up into what is inevitable, with what is absolutely inevitable. That's what this moment is. To not hold back, to not tell yourself, hmm, 
maybe later. Because spirit is not about later. You will never find spirit later. <laughs> And it's actually a relief to, to say, I give up, to say, I stop, to say, I surrender. I surrender the game of self-improvement. I surrender the game of believing things are going to get better in the future. I used to think better was good. Make your good better and your better best. It's a wheel. It never ends. And then at some point you, you just surrender and you give up all attempts at making a better future. The past is gone, the future is but imagined. These concerns are but defenses. The past is a concern. The future is a concern. That's what we're opening to. We're opening to a state of mind that doesn't have any past regrets or future concerns. Any. Because why? Because they're all really the same. Every thought of the future is the same. It's just a projection of a belief in the past. Are you open to living a life without ambition? I see a nodding <laughs> head in the front row. <laughs> Are you open to living without ambition? Because ambition is competition. And competition is cutthroat. And if you go down that road, if you step one little baby toe down that road of competition, it will cost you the awareness of presence. You don't really think Jesus was competitive. If you read A Course in Miracles, does Jesus ever compare himself to other teachers? Ever? Is there ever any good, better, best? Coming from Christ's mind? No, no. In A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, Never underestimate the need to be vigilant against the idea of competition. That's your mind training, that's your focus, that's your attention. Any time a thought of competition enters the mind, or even a thought of comparison, that's just a desire to block the awareness of pure oneness. Because there is no competition in oneness. Oneness doesn't compete, there's nothing to compete against. And certainly love doesn't compete. In romantic love, in linear time love, there's competition. There's jealousy. There's envy, there's insecurity, there's a sense of being incomplete. And there's a lot of anxiety that's tied into that construct as well. But that's not what God's will is for us either. The only way you can see that there's no world apart from your mind is to let go of the pursuit of self-concepts and self-concept images. That's the only way you can come into an actual experience of awakening. Until that comes, then awakening and enlightenment are just another concept, future concept. Someday. And Jesus tells us, be not content with future happiness, for it is not your just reward. For you have cause for freedom now. 
That's pretty strong. That used to be a pretty nice concept, didn't it? Future happiness. That was a pretty acceptable concept for a while. It's a concept. Some of you have read Disappearance of the Universe. Past lifetimes, future lifetimes, be not content with future happiness, for it is not your just reward. So, you can feel there's a call in your, in your mind, there's a call into presence, and really that's what this afternoon is about. I want to fully join you in accepting that call. It doesn't prescribe how the world should look, it doesn't prescribe that you live in a cave, or that you live in the forest, or that you live in a community, or that you, your life looks a certain way. Because this call is so much deeper than the idea of this form or versus that form. It's like, it's the call to come into harmony, to be in harmony with everything and everyone. That's all it really is. It's just a call into harmony. So I want to, as always, open it up to questions, comments, anything. <laughs> the call isn't this strong. That's strong enough yet. <laughs> For me, I think. I'm um, really using the competition words. So. Yeah, it, seemed, it maybe seemed for a while easier to accept certain concepts from the world and discard other ones. But then again, it's like the more the, the veils come off, there's something inside the heart that, that never could quite accept the competition pill. You know, it's almost like it tried its best to live with it. And until you experience miracles, I mean, I was in university for 10 years, and degrees, and was trained, and I could adapt and adjust to the lies of the world, which is, a, the world is a world of scarcity slash abundance. You know, some seem to be in great lack, and some seem to not be in great lack, and it's, the world kept telling me it's better to be abundant than to be lacking. But the ones that were in the abundance category, they still weren't content and restful. They're still on, on a wheel too. In fact, the ones that would kind of make it with the nest egg and the savings and push all the right buttons and do all the right things, they were just as stressed or more stressed when they seemed to have the possession and they seemed to have the control that they thought would bring them contentment. There still was unfulfillment in that. And it's been great for me to travel around 49 of the United States and 38 countries in the world to meet people, to meet famous people, to meet scholars, to meet waitresses and janitors, and to meet thousands and thousands and thousands of people, and to just kind of also be the observer and watch and see, is there any everlasting contentment and rest on the wheel? Or is this wheel a defense against some amazing state of mind? And it wasn't until I actually thought, well, the only way I'll ever know for sure is to step out of it. Can't you have like a good job and a state of mind at the same time? Mm -hmm. People have asked me, can you ever have it be a, an enlightened CEO? <laughs> 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 yeah. Can we ever take the world, the best that the world has to offer, like the CEO in it? And I say no, absolutely not. But you have to, you still have to live. 
you have to you earn some money and stuff. You just can't step out of everything. And well, you know, that's the way my life went. It, it was 24 years ago, actually, when I, I had been studying the Course for five years. Uh -huh. And I just, and of course, I'd been raised in Christianity too, and you know, look at the lilies of the field, they neither spin nor toil. They are clothed even greater than Solomon. Mm -hmm. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all else will be added to, unto you. I was familiar with Jesus and his teachings. I was familiar with St. Francis. Here I am in Europe now. In the 12th century there was this guy down in Assisi that, that seemed to strip his clothes off. I never went to that length. I, my parents never had to see a naked David walking down the street and go, Oh my God! What are the neighbors going to think? Uh, he is, but that's what St. Francis' parents had to go through in the 12th century, when he literally stripped down in the town square, folded his little clothes up, and handed them back. His mother could at least make eye contact, but some of you are aware of the story. His father was so much into the family business, and with clothing, and buying, and selling, and everything, that his father couldn't even look him in the eye when he said, I give you back your clothes, I give you back your name. He gave back his name. He gave back the family name. He literally disrobed of everything, and that was quite a, a symbol of, of following the teachings of Jesus, because Jesus had taught 12 centuries earlier that God will take care of you if you are devoted to serving God. But Jesus didn't get naked? No, he didn't. He, he actually went to the wilderness and, and went through the same temptations that you and I have faced, the same temptations to take care of the world first. Mm -hmm. he, he had to face the same temptations that all the yogis and the saints and the mystics have to face. Mm -hmm. The full on front, front, like facing this, this darkness, this belief that you're human mm -hmm. and that you have to survive. We have a saying called, look out for number one. The number one is the hero of the dream, it's the body. Mm -hmm. It's not look out for the spirit, it's look out for the body. Mm -hmm. So what my experience was, was it was a leap of faith where I thought, well I've got ten years of university, including undergrad, grad, behind. I've got degrees, mm -hmm. I've got all the tools that it, that it takes to make it in the world, and, and it looks like I could do a pretty good job of not only surviving, but but striving and arriving. I could get the nest egg, I could get accomplishments, I could get a roof over my head, or maybe a number of roofs over my head. And not only a car, but several cars, and so on and so forth, and make something of myself, make a name of myself, and this and this. I actually was so devoted and reading the Course for eight hours a day, that something happened that I really hadn't fully anticipated, was I actually started to hear Jesus speaking to me. And he was saying things to me like, you will not have a career. You've done that before. This is about escape. This is about transcendence now. This isn't about going through and having a spiritual career earning money. You know, I will provide for you, as I told you in the Bible, and as I told you in the Course, I made it explicitly clear, but you must give over all aspects of what you believe to be the life of David. You have to give over the dream character, because it's not going to work if you do it partially, you have to do it fully. Mm -hmm. And then, that's when the miracles ignited. That's when I just took off and things just started showing up. I went through five years of not having, now Jesus said, the, the birds of the air have their nests, and the foxes have their holes, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. I went through a five year training program of learning to experience the truth of divine providence. Because we've heard about divine providence from Mother Teresa, and Jesus, and St. Francis. It's pretty rare actually throughout human history. Most people don't even 
go there. Mm -hmm. But those those are three that I think we could say they went there mm -hmm. for sure. And what I was hearing from Jesus is you will never know it for sure unless you try it. Unless you actually take a leap of faith and when I say I will handle everything for you if you'll do this one thing for me. Answer the call, forgive. You do this for me, I'll do that for you. This is a, a divine destiny. And the only way you'll know it for yourself is to do it. So I had no pup tent. I had no place of residency. I went for five years, you know, from 1991 to 1996, without knowing where the body of David would actually lay his head down. There weren't, there weren't motels used in there, nothing like bank accounts and motels and stuff like that. It was, it was like, I will show you that you are perfectly taken care of if you will do this for me. And you know who needed it the most? I did. Because I had all those years of, 10 years of university, that actually the first months I kept turning down offers. Here, come, I'll give you some food, come and stay with me, you can sleep here, da da da. I was too proud mm -hmm. at the beginning to actually say yes. I said, no, 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 I can handle it, I can handle it, until Jesus finally said, would you stop that? <laughs> that is me, <laughs> doing my function. I told you I would take care of you without your effort, without your past learning, without your college degrees, without all your education, I can handle it just fine. And, and even the last job that I seem to have came in a very miraculous way, as if it was just dropped in and given. As if I, I mean, I, I had forgotten that I had sent resumes out five years ago, and it was an old dusty resume that was discovered on the top of a stack. That was the last worldly job that I had. And even that was miraculous, because I said, how did you even get my resume? And, you know, it turned into another miracle story. But until we know, until we know our complete dependence on spirit, we don't know anything. The human being is a construct that was made by the ego, and it literally doesn't know anything at all. Even thinking that it knows something about the world is, is craziness. But the spirit can guide you to go to a certain job, can it? Yes. And that's how it went for me, because I had, I had student loans. And Jesus never teaches just be like an ostrich, put your head in the sand and pretend that it doesn't exist. If the ego sets you up in debt, the Holy Spirit's got to unwind you. And for most people, most people in the world have, have debt. I would say, at least they have the belief in debt, if they don't have a massive student loan or a mortgage or something. And so we do have to, to be unwound. It's not like we yank ourselves or we're yanked out of the thinking of the world. We have to be guided step by step. So, yeah, I think it's a great question because, in a sense, I wanted to first have an experience that Spirit was my boss. Instead of having an earthly boss, mm. I thought I would rather like to experience a divine boss. Someone who doesn't know, listening to instructions from someone who does. That was, I could work with that. Mm. So it was David asking, 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 help me, help me, show me, show me. And in the Course in Miracles, Jesus says, you can see this world without any help at all. But if you want to see a world a forgiven world, if you want to see a light beyond this world, you need help. There's no way you egoically are, are going to see beyond this veil. Mm -hmm. So that's what I call God dependence. That's what I call divine providence. Mm -hmm. And that's why I have been able to go for 24 years without reinforcing the belief in reciprocity. I'll do this for you if you pay me. I'll do this for you in exchange for services, that it, it all works out beautifully. There's never been a time of need or lack. Yeah. And is it a fairy tale? It, it does seem kind of fairy tale-ish, you know. I mean, I always remember, 
I would read the fairy tales and I would watch the Disney movies and the Pixar movies and all those things. And nowhere in those movies were they struggling about how they're going to pay the mortgage. You never hear Cinderella, you know, wondering about saying to the prince, okay, I'll marry you. What's in your bank account? <laughs> you know, or, you know, talking to the stepmother, stepsisters and everything with all these logistics. I know in this world, most of the talk I hear, the chatter of the world is all about logistics. It's not really about content, it's about specific logistics. It's like one long logistical nightmare. It just goes on and on, day after day, and you solve one set of logistics and then you get another set. And then you go, finally you make it into bed at night and you go, Phew, man, what a logistical world. This is a logistical nightmare and then you've got to deal with more logistics the next day. But I, I have found that the spirit handles the logistics. That's part of what I know in, with Greg and Jenny just getting married, and they're actually having fun floating around Europe and seeing how it's going to work out in, you know, in form, trusting. They had jobs, they had educations, careers, you know, no different than anyone else. That's what makes it it more impressive or more inspirational, I would say, is, is everybody's working with the same default set of time and space, and yet the happy, happy ones, or the hap happier you get, is when you realize that it can be done through you rather than by you. People say, well, for someone that's just happy and and into I need do nothing. You're pretty. You're a pretty busy mystic. You do a lot of talking and traveling, but I, it doesn't really feel like work to me. This doesn't really feel like work. But you can still own things, but not get owned by things. Now have no attachments, but have stuff. Yeah, Jesus says in the course, ownership is a dangerous concept if left to you. And he's speaking to the ego you, you know, the sleeping you. Why is it so dangerous? Because in heaven, the real you doesn't own anything. No. How could oneness possess something if there's nothing to possess? There aren't any objects. No. So, the reason it's, it's a slippery slope is because Jesus says, take not one step on this twisted staircase that leads away from heaven. For having taken one step, you will not recognize the rest yet they will surely follow. He's describing the descent away from heaven down into, oh, it won't hurt, just a little bit. <laughs> a little white lie, a little bit of possession really won't hurt. But, you know, anybody who's known the way my life's gone is, I'm into giving. Give, 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 extend, share, extend, extend, more than you could ever imagine, because you're really giving to yourself. And really it's actually more of a state of mind of giving. I'm not like a philanthropist like Carnegie or Gates or Turner or Buffett, where I'm giving away millions of dollars, because what's the point? Possession, I, sometimes people say to me, well there's, there's a big difference between having a lot in this world and being in debt. No there isn't. If you perceive yourself as having a lot of things and stuff, or you perceive yourself as deeply in debt, it's the same trap. Either way. People still try to tell me one is better than the other. Try it out. See for yourself. See if you can find peace and harmony in possession or in debt. I, I say they're both the same. The ego is that clever and sneaky. It tells you that they're different. But then when you try to play it out, and do the best to try to control it, it's crazy. Look at Howard Hughes, you know. Look at Marilyn Monroe. Go through as many examples as you want in history. You'll find it's a very, very slippery slope. And, and actually a slope that you would be better off leaving behind entirely, than trying to go skiing on. You might wipe out if you go on that slope. Yeah. Uh, as I understand it, uh, if the 
things I see is not pure love. If I don't see pure love in people or situations, that's then it's my ego. Uh, is it so? Yeah, the ego yeah. made the veil. Yeah, yeah. So if, if then most of the time, almost almost all the time, I don't see pure love. I seldom see pure love. And then I can understand that's my ego that's projecting. So, when I talk to people, when I'm talking to my ego, if I don't see total pure love in them, some, some, uh, some people, it's easier for me to, to, to not project bad things on others. It's easy to do that. I'm just uh, different levels, but I never see pure love in, in anyone. Not even you. Uh, I would like to. <laughs> I don't. My mind goes off, and, and you know I'm projecting on you too. And uh, so, <coughs> when I'm talking to you now, and I don't see a pure love, I'm talking with my ego, don't I? And I can. The answer I get is not pure because it's it's uh, it's going through my ego when I listen. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. Let's look at it this way. Everything that the ego made, the Holy Spirit can use. Everything. Without exception. So the Holy Spirit can use words. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit knows the prayer of the heart. God knows the prayer of the heart before a word is even spoken. So the Spirit is so loving, it, it's there to fully answer. And, and when a question is asked, or when you put some words out, the Spirit's always like, oh, it's so adorable. It's, you know, the Spirit sees everything is just adorable. But I need to, work, to use words. Yes, okay. yes, exactly. In other words, the ego made them, the ego's invested in them, but there's a higher use of words. And Jesus was a good example of that. And Buddha was a good example. Even Ramana Maharshi didn't speak many words, but it was helpful. Nisargadatta, you know, you go on and on, the, the words can be used in a very helpful way. Now you shouldn't beat yourself up about, about per perception, because that's what Greg was reading earlier, that perception can be healed if given over to the Holy Spirit. You can just say all these words and images, I, I give them over to you, to use for the Great Awakening. That's a wonderful thing. The other thing is, what you're really praying for, underneath this perception of bodies and words and the world, is for true vision. That's what your prayer of your heart is. You're calling out for Christ's vision. When those workbook lessons come in, I want to see things differently. Above all else, I want to see. Above all else, I want to see things differently. All you're asking is that the prayer of your heart rise up to reach God. And you're, you're really saying, underneath all the words, how whatever the words are, whatever the hand gestures, or kneeling, or whatever, behind all of that, the prayer of your heart is, I, I really want to see with vision. Because Jesus tells us in the Course, the body's eyes were made not to see, and the body's ears were made not to hear. Sometimes people are concerned with eyeglasses, they say, I work, I even have glasses on to correct my vision. Don't worry, it's not real vision. 2020 is not really good vision. It's still blindness! You could say I've got 2020 blindness or 2010 blindness. Blindness is blindness, you know. Stevie Wonder, you know. What a character. He's blind and yet he's got his head gone and this big smile on his face. And the keyboard going, Ray Charles, you know, Helen Keller, you know, you could go through all these characters that seem to be disabled, like, in some way, and yet they've got all this light shining through them, because the light is not of the body. And it's the same with words, you know, I heard Rumi mentioned before, and, and there's Kabir, and there's Emerson, and Thoreau, and there's all these great, spectacular poets, and when we read the poets, our hearts go, ooh, they start to swirl. We start to feel this energy going inside of us. Something's touched in our hearts through those words. 
Rumi, my gosh, you know. I mean, my words. Yes. Yes, through your words. But I am no use of my words. Well, I, I hear... I can hear your words, and the Spirit can use your words. And, 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 uh, why not yours? Why, why not because yours? I'm talking them in lack. It's lack that's uh, the, the beginning of them. The question is lack. Why should I, why should I use words in a projection? Because it's from lack. But I mean, I really mean, are my words really for me? Uh, because I don't need them. I can listen. I can ask the spirit to talk to me through others. But do I really need my words? Why, why, why should I need them? Uh, if the spirit's not telling me not to speak. Uh, well, I think. Your words, first of all, it takes courage to ask a question. I mean, it's it can seem easy just to sit back and not question anything, just to accept what our parents told us, what the government told us, what we read in books, just to blindly accept all this hodgepodge of much ado about nothing, Shakespeare calls it. It's easy to accept all this hodgepodge of nothingness. And I think it takes courage to start to question. That was the first thing that happened to me. I didn't, I wasn't hard on myself. In fact, Jesus said, good, good, we need to do more of this. You need to question everything that you perceive and everything you believe in your mind. That's a good use of questions. You don't have to be talking like Buddha or Jesus in one instant. You know, there, there's a, seemingly a phase where you, first you give yourself permission to ask questions. And that's what I did at the beginning with the Course. I just was always asking these questions of spirit. I was very curious. I was happy that this curiosity got reignited. Because if you're in the I know mind, if you actually believe you already know something about the world, then the mind is actually closed to healing. I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe I know. Yeah, no. that's, and that's why you're asking questions, but that's good too. So I think you need to just realize that that's actually, you're actually following spirit, even in the, the questioning aspect. It's working. When I went to a movie years ago, I, I was at the movie theater and there was a mother with her, her small child sitting next to her, and the little boy was questioning everything about the movie. Why did that happen? Why did, where did she come from? Who's that? And for two hours the child just very loudly, verbally questioned, asked like 300 questions. And I have to tell you, my experience was, I fell in love. I absolutely fell in love. I, I quickly let go of my belief that I had paid money, to go and watch a movie, I actually started to tune in to the curiosity of this young boy. Did and you I, listen? I was, oh, yeah. I wasn't yeah. even paying attention to the movie after a while. I was so in love with this little boy, because I thought, how wonderful. That, and I thought, I was so in love with his mother too, that she would let him do that in a movie theater. I thought, that's amazing courage, amazing faith that she would let her, her boy do that for the entire movie. And it worked out beautiful. No ushers came in, nobody came in to interrupt it. I fell in love. I felt lifted up. I left that movie so happy. I thought, well, oh, that's one of the best experiences I've ever had in a movie theater. Because I tuned in to the curiosity of that little boy who didn't think, he didn't presume that he knew anything. And it was almost like taking his mother's hand, just saying, show me, teach me. You know, I love that. I, I wanted the same curiosity that that little boy had. I wanted to be that curious about spirituality as he was. So, yeah, there's no problem with the questioning, you know, it's just the spirits, even using your, your words and your questions. I don't have an opinion about anything in this world. Um, that's the, 
that's the joy of it. I, I don't, I have discovered that there is no such thing as a dualistic world. So when people ask me about politics, about communism and democracy, believe me, I was, I did, I did kindergarten, I did grades 1 through 12, I did 10 years of full time of university, including undergrad and grad, and I actually had a very eclectic career, so to speak, uh, in, in college, where I, I studied conservatory of music, conservatory of art, I was in the College of Design, Art and Architecture, I, I studied engineering, and I did calculus, I did trigonometry, I did everything in this world, all the different disciplines, I had my fingers in every pie. And it also was very helpful when Jesus said, now, have you seen enough? <laughs> that all of these disciplines, that all of these education systems, and all of these different areas, were all made up by the ego. And there was no wisdom in any of them. Absolutely none. That, that literature, the poets, some of them were starting to send me in the right direction. Psychology, most of Freud, you know, Oedipus Complex, and you know, oh my God, it was, you know, he, he had a great curious mind to discover the mind, but he had a lot of theories that were pretty twisted. The ego was all over those. And actually Freud was, was terrified of God. He was absolutely terrified of God. He didn't bring God into his teaching. Carl Jung, the shadow, the unconscious mind, he started to... Carl Rogers, Abraham Maslow, there, are, there were symbols that started to come into my mind, even from philosophy, from psychology, from literature, whatever. I started to get the flood of symbols coming in, of spirit speaking to me through all of that. But basically Jesus said, are you about ready to end this educational career? Or are you more interested in the kingdom of heaven? than worldly education, which is ignorance. There is no such thing as learning. That's what I had to learn from Jesus after all those years of grade school, junior high, high school, and ten years of university. He said, you've got to unlearn it all. And without exception, you, you can't hang on to any bit of worldly learning, because the ego is the, what learns. The spirit doesn't learn. It was created perfect. What, what business does the spirit have learning anything? Everything that was learned was added on to perfection, and only obscures perfection. That's why Buddha said, empty your mind of everything. Buddha was not a fan of learning, and Jesus Christ is definitely not a fan of learning. I have not yet been invited to speak at a high school assembly principal, the teachers probably run me out of the place. Oh my God, what is he teaching here, you know? But I'm teaching happiness, actually, that's, that's what my life is about now. But, but this is the wisdom of the perennial wisdom of all the great sages, which basically say, you have to re let go, reverse this idea that you're a person accumulating more ideas. Because it's going nowhere. It's going nowhere. Uh, there is a question there. You know, it says several times in the book that uh, it's only my thoughts that could hurt me. Or harm me, I don't know mm -hmm. the English word. But that's I can be hurt by nothing but yeah, my hurt. thoughts. Yeah. Hurt. And then it says that I can elect to change every thought that hurts me. And it describes like a process there, starting by little but getting more and more. Yeah. Till I'm convinced that there is no suffering. But w what does Jesus mean there with change? Change your thoughts. I can change the thoughts that hurt me. That's part of his, his mind training program, where at the beginning he starts off with um, Lesson number four is the first time he starts talking about thoughts in the workbook. Lesson number ten out of 365 is the second time he starts talking about thoughts. And uh, these thoughts
thoughts do not mean anything, my thoughts do not mean anything. He's first identifying all the thoughts that you think you think as a human being are all attack thoughts. All of them. And then underneath this heavy, thick layer of attack thoughts, which is all thoughts of the past and the future, are these real thoughts. And the Holy Spirit's job is to take you to change your mind about your mind from believing in these attack thoughts to experiencing only thoughts I think with God. My mind holds only what I think with God. That's where it's all heading, swirling quickly down to that. But only the Holy Spirit can make that transition. How is the Holy Spirit going to go from a mind filled with attack thoughts to a mind that has only, I am as God created me, I am spirit, I am one. You know, how are you going to go from trillions of attack thoughts down to only thoughts that you think with God? It's called guidance. I have to be tell you, that's what the last 24 years have been. Go here, go there, call so and so, you know, go to India. Okay, that was an interesting one that just came in. All these thoughts are guidance thoughts, and it's from the Holy Spirit, which is loosening the mind from thinking it knows anything about anything in this world. It's almost like you're going, unwinding from these attack thoughts, and you're going into these pure thoughts. When Nina and I were meditating, well, while Greg and Jenny were talking, we were just in a deep meditation outside, out, out in the lobby, and it was a meditation of emptiness. I remember we have been meditating for I don't know how long it was, and then Nina just opened her, mind, her eyes and said, I'm empty. I am really empty. I can't even imagine a word coming out of this <laughs> emptiness. And that's that's the gift of the Holy Spirit, to take you from seemingly trillions of attack thoughts down into be still and know that I am God. That's, the, that's like the drain. <laughs> when you get down to the emptiness, when the mind is really drained. Yeah, you know, because I, I think that I could detach myself from the thoughts, but not actively, actively change them. Uh, it sounds like more affirmations if I try to change them. But I could look at them and detach from them. Yes, it's, and, it's actually a and good they are then replaced. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great affirmation. It that way. You can think Stefan yeah. will never change his mind. It's good. Stefan will never change his mind because Stefan's part of actually part of the problem. <laughs> Stefan's not. Yes, not good. Stefan will never be part of the solution. No. Just like in the end, Jesus, yeah. the man, was yeah. part of the problem, and the Christ Spirit is the solution. Yeah. The, the I amness is the solution. Jesus, the yeah. his, historical man, that was another one, attack thought. Most people don't like to think of Jesus Christ as an attack thought, but what I'm saying is, you won't hear this in most lectures either, but what I'm saying is, in the end he told me, Forgive me your illusions. He says that a couple times in the Course. What he's saying is, forgive the man, forgive the apostles, forgive all of history and accept yourself as the I Am Presence. That's what he's talking about when he says, forgive me your illusions. So Stefan will never change his mind. It's good to know that from the beginning, because otherwise you can drive yourself nuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> trying, yeah. Trying to That's do what it. I did. Reading that, I was I checked to change that thought and that thought and that thought. But I was smiling out there. I was actually smiling, and I was in my meditation. I heard your voice, and I started to smile. And then I heard your voice say, I started out to visit my old mother today, yeah. driving the car, and somehow, I ended up here. Yeah. Now that's a miracle. That's a miracle. See, you didn't try to make that happen. No, I just noticed. You noticed that yeah. you ended up here. That is the room to What's this place called? Hands? Hand? Heart in hand. Heart in hand. You ended up in heart in hand instead of your old mother. See, I can even say the words old mother, but I don't have any guilt about it because I know that yeah. old is unreal and mother. Yeah. So, you, you, you see, it starts to get all funny after a while. Yeah. It's all like people say, military intelligence. A lot of you can laugh at that joke, right? <laughs> military intelligence, you see the oxymoron there? 
military intelligence, we can start to do that with old mother. <laughs> we can start to do that with everything, because why? Because the ego made it all up to try to keep us guilty. And the more we loosen our mind from these concepts, you start to realize that you're none of them. You were never Stefan. That's the release. That's, gonna, that's the ultimate release point. I am. You don't have to put the Stefan word at the end of I am. <laughs> it's enough. Yeah. Before Abraham was, I am. You see, that's what Jesus yeah, was yeah, teaching. Yeah, Before the Old Testament was, I am. Before Moses was, I am. Before Abraham, you know, people are, oh my gosh, he's, he's our father, the father of the Jewish tribe. You're, what? What kind of grammar are you speaking? Before Abraham was, I am. You know, yikes. Play, play. You got your structure wrong. No, he didn't. He had it right. Before time was, I am. But that's why we have to be so willing to empty our mind of everything, because how are we going to experience the I amness that's prior to time if we're so addicted to linear time? How will I ever remember I amness if I'm so addicted and I'm counting the days and the hours, I'm counting my paycheck, I'm counting how much I owe. You, you have to give all that over to the Holy Spirit and say, help! I want to devote my mind to a higher purpose, but I know you're going to handle all of the specifics and logistics for me if I give it all over to you. Say, you take it. You know, I got such a relief when you said the stuff I would never change his mind. Because I, then I could see it. I don't have to fix that. I just have to look at it. You're off the hook. <laughs> yeah. Stefan is off the hook of trying to figure out how to change his mind. Yeah. How do I do that every thought? Stefan would never change his mind. They would never learn to pronounce your name right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're free. <laughs> See, this, yeah. this whole world is very simply the belief in private minds and private thoughts. So, the reason that some thoughts are pushed down and not talked about is because the mind actually believes they're true. It believes in secrets, it believes that some of its thoughts are unconscious, and it believes some of them are, are not good to share. If I share this, I could lose my boyfriend. If I share this, I could, I could lose my house. If I share this, I could lose my job. Now, I always say you have to use discernment. You, you're not going in to your boss tomorrow and saying, listen, the world's an illusion and, and these tasks that you've been giving me are illusory tasks and, and I, I'm just going to have to let you go. <laughs> Actually, the Holy Spirit wants you to reach a place of such God dependence and such reliance on the Holy Spirit's voice that you, in the end, will let go of, of corporations, of families, that's what Jesus taught, you know, he, he said, follow me, leave everything behind. He was talking to the mind, he wasn't saying, you know, you can just take this off. He didn't tell St. Francis, just take off your clothes and you'll be enlightened. St. Francis did that, it was symbolic of, of letting go of the past. That was just a symbolic gesture. He still had a lot to deal with. After he still had to put some clothes on when he went out and lived in San Damiano in the, the cold snow. He didn't wear sandals, but he, he still had to face a lot of things. It was just a symbolic gesture. And that's all we're doing, is we're just saying, Holy Spirit, guide me. Use the things of time and space so I can unwind my mind from the guilt of believing that it's all real. I want to sing a happy song. I want to be in joy, I want to be in laughter, I want to be free, I want to feel intimacy, I want to feel love and connection with everyone and everything. That's like the prayer of the heart, that's really calling for vision, that's, that's where that all comes true, is in the light beyond the dream. You know, that's the awakening from the dream. But, but while I perceive a world, let it be a happy one. And, and there's one simple thing that you have to do to experience the happy dream, and that's don't judge it. Don't judge anything about it. Don't think, this is better, this is worse, this is good, this is bad. 
we can't play this game of good illusions and bad illusions, and higher illusions and lower illusions. You know, in the end, we, we have to start to realize they're all the same. But it's only the Holy Spirit that can take us there. I have this question in my mind, just going around. Uh, how can I just surrender? I just want to surrender, you know? And I don't know how. I just want to surrender. Do you have anything to say about that? Well, the thing that helped me in the Course is when Jesus says, He said, you have been poorly taught. Oh, well, here we go. I've been poorly taught. And then he said, resign now as your own teacher. And then he said, you have taught what you are, but you have not allowed what you are to teach you. That was pretty profound. You have taught what you are, but you have not allowed what you are to teach you. So it's like, this is the human condition of, of trying to tell stories, trying to convince people of things, trying to justify things. There's so much guilt. The mind is so guilty in this sleeping state that it's always trying to justify something, prove something. And in the end, you know, that, like that prayer when you get down on your knees and, and you just, it can even just be one word, help. That was my favorite prayer. <laughs> Help! <laughs> I mean, really, from the heart, really seeing like I need it. I need a lot of help. So I was always like, help, 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 help. And and just from the you know the attitude of that help, it's very humble. That's why I think people sometimes fall down on their knees because it just feels like it's like a surrender position. Like I, I can't do it. That's how, of course, the miracles came. Was two research psychologists. Helen Schuckman, you know, was listening to her boss one day, talking about the whole condition of their working conditions and the stress and how crazy it was in New York City, Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, and went through the whole spiel. And he said, there must be a better way. There must be a better way. And he thought that she was going to make some joke or, you know, kind of give him a smart remark or something. Like, oh Bill something like that, but she instead said, you're right Bill, and I'll help you find it. And just in that little crack of willingness, of, of humility and humbleness, to say there has to be a better way to live, and the answer came, that the Course in Miracles actually came with a lot of personal references in the original dictation that had a lot to do with Helen and Bill, and even though most of that was edited out, it's, it came from a prayer. And I join you in that prayer right now. I, I know that you, you have a calling, and that that calling will make you so happy <clears throat> to say yes to that. So very happy. And, and things can, can fall apart. Uh, yesterday, Naya and I watched this movie, I Am Han. And it's based on a true story. And in that movie there was a child being killed, there was seemingly racial, racial prejudices, um, all kinds of things. It was very emotional. I had just had all these tears of joy coming through. And, and the joy, when I watch a movie like that, is, is the joy of the Spirit coming through me so strong. It's kind of like, of what's real and what's true, which just grows so strong in me. But it's such a powerful mechanism for drawing that out in me and through me. And I just felt just so grateful. Just had, I was like rinsed out, I just had the tears of joy pouring down. I couldn't, couldn't hold them in. And I remember afterwards, Nina said she just, her heart felt so open, like thoroughly opened up. But it's just the Spirit's use of the symbols, just as another reminder of how, how loved we are. That all of these, these make-believe things, you know, can't really take away that love. They can't, it can't really even cover it. It's just bursting through.
I always say too that everyone I meet, I feel like we are lifelong companions in this journey. And, and that's all that this all is about for me, is just for this moment. Just for that moment of connecting, of saying, yes, together we, we shall overcome. Together the ego cannot stop us. You know, we are so joined, and, and I really feel that with everyone that I meet, that we are lifelong companions on this. That we're drawing forth each other, our mind is drawing forth witnesses right now, in kind of a quantum way, like it's time to wake up. Time has come. And we're, we're drawn very strongly into that. And, and it's like a symphony, it's like that movie you, Kai Pollock you have over here, As It Is In Heaven. I got to meet Kai Pollock and he showed me his storyboards and how he, he told me how he met his wife, who's his soulmate, and his sister, and how the three of them storyboarded that amazing movie, spectacular movie, As It Is In Heaven. And, and I thought, that's, he found his calling. He's, Somebody just told me he's just almost got, the second one is almost, the sequel is almost done. It's mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. got so many more months of production, but it's, it's already been filmed, it's, it's coming. Mm -hmm. And he told me that himself, he said all these 15, 20 years of filmmaking, he never really found his calling, even though he was one of the most renowned filmmakers over here, Kai Pollock, until that miracle happened with that movie, he, he never knew what it was, all four. All his skills were just empty until he joined together with his wife and the three of them with his sister, they got the spirit juices started flowing. And, and he was a 20 year course student who decided, you know, I'm going to let God come through me. And I think it's a masterpiece of as far as spiritual awakening. I show that movie at the beginning of like a week or a week. Because people's hearts open up on day one, and it's a piece of cake. The, the other six days are, <laughs> we're like sliding down the slope, you know, because everybody is so open. They don't have to like feel each other out for three or four days. They just watch as it is in heaven, and boom, their hearts on their sleeve, you know, and and they're open. Hmm. Yeah, my my mother, she's ninety six now. She, she is old. She, she, uh, she has always loved uh, watching movies. And then I gave this movie to her when she was about uh, 90. And she watched it and said, Oh, Stefan, this is the best movie I ever saw. <laughs> she was just crying. And, uh, yeah. yeah. What a gift to be able to just share that with <laughs> Yeah. <her. laughs> Yeah. And hear that. 